All right, folks, this is Joseph P. Farrell on Thursday, February 27th, 2014, the year beyond Thunderdome, and I had intended to talk today about technology and things like that, but the Ukraine story just has to take front, front page, front and center, um, because there's so much going on up there that uh, I need to I need to comment about it, and I hope also that you'll understand today I'm actually recording this on a different platform than YouTube. I tried earlier today, and it cut out on me no less than three times. So bear with me. I'm new to this technology that I'm using today. But anyway, I want to talk about the Ukraine. I want to put it into a context of, number one, that hidden system of finance that I've been talking about for a number of years since the, the bearer bond scandals broke back in 2009. And I also want to put it in the context of the geopolitics that I think may be going on here. I'm not a geopolitician. I'm certainly not trained in that. So take whatever I say on that score with a grain of salt. But nonetheless, I think those two contexts are essential if we're going to understand what's taking place. Now, I want to begin by talking about an article that was written by George Soros that many of you sent me in respect to the Ukraine. And I want to read something here that he says I find very interesting. It's almost an admission. Okay, quote, he says, whether that unity now in the Ukraine endures will depend on how Europe responds. Ukrainians have demonstrated their allegiance to a European Union that is itself hopelessly divided, with the Euro crisis pitting creditor and debtor countries against one another. That is why the EU was hopelessly outmaneuvered by Russia in the negotiations with the Ukraine over an association agreement. True to form, the EU under German leadership offered far too little and demanded far too much from the Ukraine, unquote. Now let's stop right there, because that's an interesting admission about Germany's role in all this. They wanted far too much and were willing to give far too little, and that is a circumstance that's bound to drive the Ukraine back to Moscow. Now you'll recall that I said in a couple of previous news and views that the German foreign minister went to Moscow and they had nice, friendly, open talks about the need for transparency and so on. He visited with President Putin. He came back and it looked like Germany was going to withdraw some of the pressure that the EU was putting on the Ukraine. And then Chancellor Merkel gets hit with scandals involving child pornography and so on and so forth with members of her cabinet. So in other words, I think that that was a message to Germany from the covert specialists in America to sing on the same page. And Germany, you recall, has also been making moves with France for an independent European internet free of American influence and electronic spying. So in other words, there's more going on here that meets the eye that is taking place behind the scenes with respect to the Ukraine and with respect to Germany. Soros is kind of hinting that he knows what the game has been. Let me continue with now with what he says. Quote, now, after the Ukrainian people's commitment to closer ties with Europe fueled a successful popular insurrection, the EU, along with the International Monetary Fund, there we go, folks, ding, 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 is putting together a multi-billion dollar rescue package to save the country from financial collapse, unquote. Bull roar. What they're talking about is imposing st stringent conditions on the Ukraine and getting the Ukraine locked into the Western EU system of finance that will keep the Ukraine perpetually in the Western orbit and out of Moscow's. That's what the game is, okay? Quote, but that will not be sufficient to sustain the national unity that the Ukraine will need in coming years. I established the Renaissance Foundation in the Ukraine in 1990 before the country achieved independence, unquote. Now stop right there, because that's a, as much as an admission that you'll ever get, that he has had a role quietly and behind the scenes as a private channel for funds going to the covert operations people, all right? That's as close as you're ever going to get to an admission, but many suspect, I among them, that that's exactly what his role has been. 
Quote, the foundation did not participate in the recent uprising, but it did serve as a defender of those targeted by official repression. The foundation is now ready to support the Ukrainian strongly felt desire to establish resilient democratic institutions, above all, an independent and professional judiciary. Unquote. Now, stop right there, because that is also another admission that what they're talking about is a system of government under the aegis of the EU, under the bureaucrats of the EU. That's really what the game is here. Now, why have I bothered you with Soros? Because he's an indicator of that tight nexus between private finance, between the financial sector and covert operations that I've been arguing has been put into place since the end of World War II by the creation of a huge hidden system of finance at the end of the war by President Truman. All right, And what that effectively did is it injected the intelligence agencies into the banking business and it injected finance into intelligence, into covert operations. So in other words, we're seeing the, a structure here that has been driving events in the Ukraine. And it is that same structure, I contend, that's driving events in Venezuela that has driven them in Libya, Egypt, and Syria. Okay, It's that structure that's responsible for the formation of this policy of covert operations to topple governments we don't like and inject governments that we do. And until that structure changes, the policy is not going to change. It's a very, very dangerous situation, in other words. Now, what this means, and I've said this weeks ago, folks, perhaps even months, is that the United States, if it keeps playing this type of covert operation in areas that are part of the sphere of influence of other nations and sensitive to those nations, expect that they are going to push back in some fashion, and that fashion may include covert operations not only in America's neighbors, but in America itself. That is an inevitability if this game keeps playing out the way it is. All right. Imagine our reaction if Russia were sponsoring covert operations in Mexico, a major oil producer and a major trading partner of the U.S., to bring Mexico within the Russian sphere of influence. We know what would happen. There would be an immediate outcry and perhaps a war. In fact, the British maneuvered America into World War I by disclosing German attempts to do just that. Okay, so in other words, the game hasn't changed very much. Now, why am I, why am I saying all of this? Because I want you to listen to words of Secretary of State Ketchup Kerry, that's what I like to call him, in response to what's going on now in the Ukraine. He says, quote, and, and listen, you, folks, you can't bottle and package hypocrisy as well as he just did in this statement. Listen to this. He says, quote, Kerry, during an interview with the wife of the former boss of the Federal Reserve, Andrea Mitchell, demanded Russia, quote, respect the Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity to end provocative rhetoric and actions, to support democratically established transitional governing structures, and to use their influence in support of unity, peace, and an inclusive path forward, unquote. All right. Now, imagine Secretary of State Kerry saying, respect territorial integrity and the sovereignty of nations, which is exactly what the U.S. is not doing in Syria and is not doing in Venezuela. All right. Now, let me let me put that aside for a moment in as backdrop to the fact that again, if the U.S. keeps playing this playbook, we are going to get pushback. Now, here comes the pushback. Recently, Russia mobilized its militia in the Crimea. That's the part of the Ukraine that has remained more or less intentionally loyal to Russia. And the reason why is there is a city, a, a port city in the Crimean called Sevastopol. All right. Sevastopol has been for at least two and a half centuries the home base, the, the home port of the entire Russian Baltic or pardon me, Black Sea fleet. All right. Sevastopol was the scene of the major battle during the Crimean War during the 19th century between Britain, France, and Turkey and Russia that led to the creation of the poem called The Charge of the Light Brigade. It's about 
their siege of Sevastopol. It was a scene of a major and bloody battle during 1942 and World War II between the Soviets and the Germans, when the Germans subdued and subjected the city to a massive artillery bombardment, the largest in World War II, in fact. So in other words, Sevastopol is a place that Russia has always vigorously defended, and the reason why is it's the base, the home port, of their Black Sea fleet. They have other ports in the Black Sea, but Sevastopol has traditionally been the major base. And after the formation of the Ukraine, one of the things that Russia insisted upon was the Ukraine could not be independent unless the Russians had special basing rights in Sevastopol. Now, with this change of government in the Ukraine, that, that status has been threatened. And what that means is, look at the map. If you take away the major port in the Black Sea for the Russian Black Sea fleet, they only have one other naval base in that region of the world, and that's Tartus in Syria. So in other words, the objective of encircling Russia and geopolitically removing their influence from the Middle East is exactly what's in play here. So expect major pushback. Now here it comes. <laughs> okay, This is an article. Uh, posted by Tyler Durden at Zero Hedge on February 26th. So in other words, just yesterday. <laughs> okay. And the headline is, Russia responds to U.S. warning expands military presence globally. And this is based on a report from RIA Novosti, which is, of course, the Russian news uh, agency, the uh, wire service. And it says this, RAI, or pardon me, RIA Novosti reports Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu saying Russia has plans, quote, to expand permanent military presence outside its borders by placing military bases in a number of foreign countries, unquote, including Vietnam, there's your ally with China, your alliance with China protecting the oil routes to China, Cuba, Venezuela, ding, 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 Nicaragua, the Seychelles, and Singapore. Quote, the talks are underway and we are close to signing the relevant documents, unquote, Shoigu told reporters in Moscow. The minister added that the negotiations cover not only military bases, but also visits to ports in such countries on favorable conditions as well as the opening of refueling sites for Russian strategic bombers on patrol, unquote. So in other words, the pushback's begun, folks. And I suspect, regardless of the attempts of the USA to meddle with these attempts by the Russians to establish strategic bases, we may be successful in one or two instances, but not universally. And this pushback is only going to increase, and eventually, if the U.S. keeps playing these covert operations cards on the BRICS nations and in areas around those nations where their spheres of influence are threatened, expect them, expect them to do the same in North America and in Europe. So in other words, the globalist dream could easily fall apart if the people pushing for it are wanting to push too hard and too fast. They are going to encounter resistance. Anyway, that's it for my news and views this week uh, from the Nefarium folks. I'll see you on the flip side, and God bless everybody.